It's also though, not just an AGM, it's part of a week of events that we have organized in order to fill in the gaps in our hearts for not being in Amsterdam. And so Sharp and Focus will conclude tomorrow with two more events. The, the link at the very top of the chat gives you the access to those other two events. We have a further discussion, a coffee house on membership benefits and what should distinguish being a member of Sharp and then a happy hour to conclude things. I will be at the coffee house, but not at the happy hour because it will still be 7 a.m. Um, but <clears throat> I'm sure it will be a happy event. And I really want to start off thanking all of the people who have organized that, which are mostly members of the EC, then roping in acquaintances of theirs and friends and students, and also Maria Dalbello, who's the chair of our board, who organized the earlier session today. Um, I've attended all of them and been astounded um, with the quality of the discussion that's possible, with the high level of engagement and enthusiasm displayed by everyone, and all of the good ideas. The Executive Council spends a lot of time trying to figure out how to make SHARP better. And the biggest problem we have, besides just not having enough of us and enough time, is figuring out exactly what we think members want. And so the opportunities this week have been really invaluable and will continue to lead to a lot of developments in Sharp that I think based on the feedback we're getting, members will be quite enthusiastic about. So I'm really, really pleased with how that's all gone. You should have had the annual report by now. If not, again, at the top of the chat, there's a link to it. Um, it's a concise document prepared as you'll be able to tell by the variations in tone by all of the different EC members writing in about aspects of the work that they've been doing in their area of concern. And then it concludes with an agenda. So the agenda is pretty straightforward. And for those of you who've been members of Sharp for a while, pretty typical, um, which will be a chance to review the year very, very briefly, and then have our prizes and a few other announcements and discussion. So I hope that's clear and let me switch over to my notes. Otherwise I will go on forever and not get anywhere. <clears throat> um, I want to go back to the EC members because I've been in Sharp since the first Sharp conference I came to was 1994 in Washington at the Library of Congress, which was Sharp's second conference. And then I joined the board in 2013 and became more active through since then in terms of the leadership of Sharp. And I can say with absolute confidence after this week that this is the best executive council Sharp has ever had. Everybody on it is incredibly committed to whatever tasks they're in charge of doing. And as president, it's been fantastic because it means that I'm not spending time chasing people up to get things done. I'm instead trying to keep up with them and trying to make sure that all the things that are happening kind of are coherent, but the amount of activity and energy that the members of REC have put into Sharp this year is just astounding. Um, and you will have noticed also in the report, one change to the EC membership, Simon Frost, after many years of service to Sharp, had lots of other duties impinging on his life, mostly in his personal life, and he decided to step aside. And so we have an interim director of international affairs, Jan Hilgertner, and we're really thrilled to have him with us as well. Um, and some of you will have heard him making contributions earlier today in the panel. Um, and it's, it's going really, really well. So thank you all personally from me who are on the EC, but I want all the other members to know that we're really in very good hands and very lucky. Um, so, <clears throat> and I, last year I embarrassed them by putting all the pictures. I won't do that this year. Um, the annual report, mentions issues of size and administrative assistance as things that have been weighing on us a little bit. We're a, a lovely size for getting on with each other, but an awkward size for getting enough income annually to pay for an administrative assistant to work all the time for us. Those of you who know Ellen Barth, who's on the screen, know her as our executive assistant, and we have a lot up to $5,000 US to pay her for hours over the year to do things. And she does lots of wonderful things. Um, you'll 
her name is the most mentioned name in the annual report <laughs> because each of the EC members said, oh, and thank you very much to Ellen who did this and this and this. So <clears throat> she's, yeah, she's, she's superb. But I do worry that we will over task her abilities and time. Um, so we keep an eye on that budget. And it could be that we may need to increase that area at some point. The, the huge advantage, as people said earlier today in the panel, in the, the session this morning was that we have lots of good um, ability to interact. I think it was, um, what's your name? <laughs> I've got it written down, hang on. Um, Emily Knox in her, her session said she really liked Sharp because it was small but so broad. And I think that's true. So on the whole, it's a virtue, but it's, it does cause slight strains for us compared to some other academic societies. The advantage of our size, of course, is that we can also be nimble and we can gather on Zoom and actually at least know or get to know lots of people. When I went yesterday to the material text session, I was put into a breakout room with five other people, four of whom I'd never met. And that was fantastic. Um, they were all really interesting. We, did, we only had 10 minutes, which was a shame, but understandable in the circumstances. And it's one of Sharp's great virtues as well. So it's not that I want Sharp to become huge. It's just that we, as we consider doing more and more, we have to figure out how to manage that. Um, it's also tied up with other costs and lots of possibilities and challenges, but we'll see where that goes. Um, but I did mention at the end of my beginning section of the annual report also that fundraising and um, endowment planning remain issues for Sharp. We, we've been talking about it since I joined the board in 2013. <laughs> so it's not a new issue. It's just an issue that we haven't made any progress on. So I do reiterate my call that if there's anyone who thinks they could contribute usefully to ideas about how we could manage the adequate funds that we have, we're not poor, um, how we could use those funds most effectively and plan long-term to develop them so that we can do more of what we want to do please contact me. Um, okay, let's see. I've also been hugely impressed this week with the variety of all of us attending SHARP in focus. Um, I know quite a few of the names of people there, but a lot I don't know. And a lot of them are young, and that's not a demographic that all bibliographical societies or book history societies can boast of. Um, and then, we also have a membership that really is truly global. We haven't spent any time this week discussing asynchronous options for meetings, but I think it's an area where we will have to continue to explore to enable full participation because not everyone is, has the luxury that I had this week because I was supposed to be in Amsterdam. I don't have any teaching. My children are grown and I am able to get up at three in the morning and chat with you all <laughs> and go back to bed and then not have to be able to teach in class later in the day or something. So we're, we've, I've coped very well and enjoyed it. And it's much better than the jet lag. I was kind of comparing the options. Um, so in, from a personal standpoint, it's been fine, but I couldn't sustain it more than two hours a day very easily. And I certainly couldn't sustain it if I were trying to do other things in the day that demanded more attention than this week has demanded. So we need to think hard about that, but we're not the only ones. Everybody in the world who has an academic conference is trying to figure this out. And I'm very confident that brilliant software people around the world will improve beyond, well beyond things like Zoom and that we will find more and more ways to do things really excitingly um, over time. But I am conscious that for some of us at least, and I don't know whether Martin's going to join us for the prize session, um, it will be still five in the morning for him in Sydney if he does join us. Um, so, you know, it's not easy for everybody, but it's still amazingly possible in a way that never was. And I can't imagine what the world would have been like if COVID had hit 10 years ago. Um, but fortunately, we don't have that problem. We just have it with us now. Um, <clears throat> so we do have Giles Burgle looking into the best online platform for Sharp so that we don't have to piggyback on the generosity of the university. In this case, we, we piggybacked on Munster because Munster had 
two people who could be online at the same time. I would have hosted it from Otago, but we wouldn't have had a, an alternative in case there was a need for a backup. So I'm very grateful to Carmen and Ellen again for picking up that role and enabling this to be possible this week. Okay, so that's the opening remarks. And the acknowledgement of the organizer of Sharp and Focus pretty much goes hand in hand with thanking the EC because almost everyone who's doing things for the panels, except for Maria, are on the EC um, in terms of the organization. There are lots of other participants. So I think at that point I should stop and actually ask if there are questions. I haven't been able to be following the chat. I'm, I'm woefully bad at multitasking. After one session, I was emailing Will Slaughter and Will said, yes, he'd been tweeting during the whole thing. And I'm like, I can't even read the chats and watch the screen at the same time. And he's doing three. So for those of you who are better at this, wonderful. And thank you very much for making Sharp visible in lots of other ways. Um, but for now, I think you've got the annual report. If there are things you'd like to know that you're concerned about or would like to commend or ask more detail about, please feel free now and then we'll move on to the prizes after that. <clears throat> Okay, I don't want to embarrass people by going as long as I would with my students to force them to talk. <laughs> so um, obviously you've got the, the one, I mean, our, our annual report is very low key, but the great benefit of the format that we've established over time is that you have the email address of every EC member and their name. So if there's anyone you want to know more from, you know how to contact them. Okay, well at that point then, it's my pleasure to hand over to Mel, who will manage the announcements for the book history prize, I mean, for the book prize, for the DeLong prize. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to announce this, especially because we have all of the authors here tonight and uh, or morning, wherever you are. And we've got some of the judges, too. So this year, the judges for the award, Fiona Black, Michael Hancher, Martin Lyons and Brigitte Ouvrier-Véal, read an impressive total of 58 eligible books that were submitted um, for the prize, um, all copyrighted in 2019. Um, I echo what Chef said, we were assisted brilliantly by Ellen, she's been magnificent and we couldn't have done this without her, um, who's the executive assistant. So the, the books were really wide ranging and addressed a rich, rich variety of periods, geographical regions, and intellectual challenges, ranging from five centuries of illustrations from a, of a Spanish national hero, um, to the relationship between early black print culture and African American citizenship, to the dictionary feuds of the 19th century, to women in Canadian publishing, to Japanese family magazines in the interwar era. So the topics and approaches really, really impressed the judges, making their reading experience a really rewarding one. So as in prior years, the robust range of subjects and the approaches taken confirm the wide reach of that constantly evolving field term, the history of the book. So now to the, the winner and the commendations. So this year we have one winner and three commendations, which um, we'll announce now. And I'm delighted to say that all of the authors um, are with us um, to collect their awards and they've expressed their delight at their success and thank Sharp and the judges um, for this opportunity. Uh, and they will be given, if they want, they don't have to, the opportunity to say a few words. Um, I think Fiona, you were gonna uh, announce the first commendation. Yes, I'm very happy to do that. So our first commendation goes to Jennifer Richards for Voices and Books in the English Renaissance, published by Oxford University Press. Richards takes the reader on an intriguing journey in search of the voice within the text, hunting for vocal cues and instances of shared readings, which turned books into performance events. 
Her fascinating and highly original study of the textual soundscapes of the English Reformation and Renaissance remind us that print is not exclusively a visual medium. Richards offers a rare but complete example of what Don Mackenzie perhaps had in mind when he asserted that bibliography can, in short, show the human presence in any recorded text. After Richards, book historians can no longer neglect the persistent presence of the voice within the culture of print. So Professor Richards is here with us to receive her commendation, which is literally me just pinging over a PDF to you in an email now. Congratulations, Jennifer. If you're here. Yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> just to say uh, thank you very much. Thank you for, to the judges for taking the time to read so many books at this really difficult time. Um, um, I'm amazed and flattered and honoured that people have actually read my book. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and I think Brigitte is going to announce the second commendation. Yes, certainly. And I, I apologize in advance for maybe mispronouncing um, the name. Um, but our second commendation goes to Fei Xian Wong for Paris and Publishers, A Social History of Copyright in Modern China. It was published by uh, Princeton University Press. Uh, Wong aims at the twofold tale of the transplantation, transplantation of the alien legal concept revisited as Benquan, not sure I pronounce it properly either, as well as its social and cultural history from the 1890s to the 1950s, when China underwent profound political changes. So in this book, the, the reader reveals in the orderly unveiling of a paradoxical struggle with piracy, in a society that has a long and sophisticated book culture, yet one where publishers are not so much intellectual property rights savages as copyright savvy economic actors. Genuine archival sources and documents, among them an intriguing glossary and an impressive Chinese bibliography, provide insider's evidence about how knowledge production was sustained then altered or renewed to meet doctrinal expectations, while provoking a rethinking of common beliefs about the influence of Western norms on Chinese print tradition, Wong also fosters a fresh as well as promising encounter between Euro-American book history and its Asian counterparts. So well done. Well done. So Dr. Wang is here to receive her commendation. Um, congratulations, Fei Xian. Thank you. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for this. I'm truly honored to receive this recognition, uh, recognition and I'm particularly delighted for uh, two reasons. Uh, first, Asian book history and print cultures, I know, have been like a small and marginal minority in the sharp community. And so I'm really grateful for the sharp and the judges to uh, recognize a non-Western, uh, non-European topic like mine. And secondly, my mentor, Adrian Zhang, won the sharp DeLong Prize in 1999 for his first book. And so I, it's truly special for me to, that my first book is also awarded uh, by the sharp. And so thank you very much. Oh, that's really lovely. Um, and I think Fiona, you're going to read the third commendation as well. Yes, I am. So it's my pleasure to read this one. Our third commendation goes to Robert Kalp for the power of print in modern China, intellectuals and industrial publishing from the end of empire to Maoist state socialism, published by Columbia University Press. Professor Kalp's impressive and interdisciplinary scholarship concerning the emergence of commercial publishing in the early 20th century provides a crucial and revealing counterpoint to the extensive histories of revolutionary China. Kalp achieves this by exploring the underpinnings and mechanics of significant cultural transformations manifested through print. In fascinating contrast to author-publisher relations in many other contemporary regions, this study uncovers a unique and highly functioning system that enabled substantial profits for publishers whilst offering a secure living to those hired to write or edit, 
textbooks, reprints of classical texts, and books in series. Robert Culp's scholarship contributes new insights to book historians' understanding of the mental work of authors and editors for a place and time almost wholly under-researched. For any region, his methods will prove truly useful for comparative analyses. For China, they lead to transformative new knowledge for our field. And I think doc Dr. Kulp is here to receive his commendation too. Congratulations, Robert. Thank you. And, and uh, like Fishin, I want to thank the, uh, the Long Book Prize Committee for giving serious consideration to the power of print, uh, which focuses on 20th century China. Um, Book history is a flourishing area of East Asian studies, and it's really gratifying to see some of that work resonating in the broader book history community and being recognized here. And it's, uh, it's particularly gratifying to, to share the rostrum with uh, Wang Feixian. Or we developed our books kind of in step, um, and so it's really nice to, to see us both here. Thank you. Oh, that's so lovely as well. Um, okay, so now to the winner. Our judge, uh, Michael Hancher, is unable to attend the virtual ceremony today. However, we, uh, oh no, Michael, you are here. But the video is fine. Run, run that if you have it. But look at your beautiful background. Well, uh, I'll watch. I'll watch. <laughs> okay, so Michael is here, but he has also pre-recorded a video, which I am hopefully going to play now. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Tell me if this isn't working. And this year, the Sharp DeLong Book History Book Award goes to Jeffrey T. Zaller for Reading and Rebellion in Catholic Germany, 1770 to 1914, published by Cambridge University Press. Richly informed by archival research, and set out in a detailed and compelling narrative, this book illuminates how a major reading community actually functioned during the efflorescence of popular print culture. Conventional notions of clerical control over the reading habits of the lower class Catholic population in Germany are dissolved by the facts discovered here, which reveal readers' prolonged and far-reaching engagement, sometimes hesitant, sometimes confident with all kinds of forbidden books. The drive for communal discipline epitomized by the Index Laborum Prohibitorum could not withstand the pervasive appeal of books as such, nor of magazines and newspapers, all of them mass-produced commodities that at once enlarged the field of discussable ideas, established a ground for private subjectivity, and advertised the allures of commodity culture. Professor Zeller's stimulating account of German Catholic readers demonstrates why the history of reading and of lower class cultures cannot be told solely in terms of the intentions of the elite, and how we should appreciate the agency of readers. It is a major contribution to book history and a model for future research. Congratulations to Professor Zaylar. Congratulations, Jeff. And um, Dr. Zaylar is here today to, to um, pick up his award. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, um, this tremendous recognition. Um, I'm quite overwhelmed by it all. I, I, I think I mentioned to you that um, I tell everyone I know that uh, the people involved in book history and uh, the history of reading um, are among the most creative and um, insightful and empirically savvy scholars I've ever met. And um, for Sharp to smile on this study, for Sharp, um, which has done so much to promote these two fields, the history of the book and the history of reading, for Sharp to uh, recognize uh, my scholarship with this wonderful award. Um, well, you can imagine um, how humbled and how very grateful I am. I wanna, I wanna thank, um, especially if, you, if you'll allow me, my doctoral advisor, Roger Chickering, uh, so long a professor at Georgetown University. Um, I believe he's listening in and um, I couldn't have done it without his support over all these years. 
Thank you once again um, to the committee, uh, to all of the members of SHARP, to the DeLong family, and um, I look forward to a relationship with SHARP for a long time to come. Thank you again. Congratulations again, Jeff. Um, and just a huge thank you to everyone that's been involved in the process this year. And a special thanks to Michael and Martin, who are going to stand down as judges this year after a two year term. Um, so now on to the Book History Editor's Prize. Yes, it's my pleasure to call on Greg Barnhissel, one of the editors of Book History, to present this prize. Can you all hear me? Is my mic on? Yes, great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I didn't realize how much I was going to miss Sharp this year. Um, it's a highlight of every summer. And so uh, it's sort of sad not to see you all in person, but I do want to thank the Sharp and Focus organizers for putting together such a great set of uh, virtual events. Uh, as most of you know, every year, Sharp's journal Book History gives a prize to the best essay written by a graduate student. Uh, we define that as uh, someone who's still enrolled in a graduate program at the time of first submission. Uh, every year we give one of these prizes to the best graduate student authored essay that appears in that year's volume. It's my great honor and pleasure to announce that the graduate student essay prize this year will go to Mary Catherine Kinneberg for her essay, The Postwar American Poets Library, an archival consideration with Charles Olson and the Maud Olson Library. So Mary Catherine's essay is a highly original combination of archival studies and theory. For those unfamiliar with it, and I suspect most of us are unfamiliar with it, the Maud Olson Library, which is located in Gloucester, Massachusetts, collects all of the books that the American poet Charles Olson used in his personal library, all the books he owned and had in his library. The library, in addition, is actually in Olson's own apartment in Gloucester and includes his own desk. But the interesting thing about the library is that these aren't his books. Those books are held at the University of Connecticut. Instead, the Maud Olson Library is a kind of simulacrum of Olson's library with separate copies of the books Olson owned that were donated or purchased at used bookstores by the library's organizers. The library, though, makes available to readers transcriptions of all of the marginal notes that Olson made in his own books and extensive descriptions of the editions that Olson did own. So Mary Catherine, in her article, gives an extensive history of the library and meditates on how it troubles and expands our notion of an archive and of our preoccupation with the actual items touched and held by a famous poet. The article was very appealing to me as I'm a big Charles Olson fan, and now I have another excuse to go to Gloucester to go visit the library. Mary Catherine, at the time she uh, authored this article and sent it in, was a doctoral student at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She has since graduated. Congratulations again, Mary Catherine. And she is now Archives and Rare Books Associate at Granary Books, which is an independent publisher that facilitates the organization, preservation, and sale of archives of contemporary artists and authors. Mary Catherine is actually here with us today, and so I will turn the mic over to her now with my repeated congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Greg, um, for that great summary of the piece. It's, it's kind of a wild one. So I really thank, um, I thank everyone who worked with me on it at Book History for acknowledging this piece. Um, this is a really meaningful award to receive. Um, Greg, it was a real pleasure working with you on this piece and working with the reviewers. And as most of us know who publish in academic journals, that's not necessarily a thing that you can just say. So I, I genuinely have had such a wonderful experience working with book history. And very briefly, I also wanna thank the, um, the, the places that made this research possible, including Lost and Found, the CUNY Poetics Document Initiative, um, helmed by my former advisor, Amiel Alkali. They provided funding and support to do this type of work and also the Gloucester Writers' Center and the Maud Olson Library for not only being so generous with their collection, but for doing the work that they do to preserve these books, to collaborate with high schools, to bring out the mysteries of, hmm, we didn't really expect Charles Olson to own that, that you can enjoy the library even if you don't know much about the creator. So especially seeing all these wonderful conversations that have been happening at Sharp and Focus and following along on Twitter about all the good work everyone's doing. I feel like 
this emphasis um, that you all gave through this prize on community archives and eclectic collections can only increase our goal of bringing more diverse voices, bringing more inclusivity to think about the type of work that we all do together. So I thank you for that. Um, and this is a real honor. I'm very appreciative. Thank you very much, Greg, and congratulations, Mary Catherine. Um, <clears throat> I would also like to thank all of the editors for Sharp, and it's a growing number of people. Um, the book, there are three book history editors, Greg and Yuri and Beth, and then several Lingua Franca editors, and those of you who were available earlier in the week met Andy and her team for Sharp News. Um, so there are a lot of people who work behind the scenes again to make all of the things possible that we get to celebrate in Sharp. And so it's wonderful. And thanks very much for all of that. We, we need it. And it is what makes our discipline both visible and lively. And we're lucky. Um, <clears throat> go back to my agenda. Brain like a sieve. Uh, plans for 2021 and beyond. Those of you who've been following your emails obviously aren't in Amsterdam <laughs> and know that Amsterdam has graciously agreed to try to mount a proper physical conference again in 2022. That has been a huge benefit to Sharp, partly because it meant that we don't lose any of our deposits on space that we had reserved for the conference. Um, and it also means that all of us who are disappointed not to be there will still get a chance. So in the meantime, 2021 was going to be in Milwaukee, but because of the current situation and other things that had gone on at the university where it's going to be, and the person who was involved changing positions, there will not be a physical conference in 2021. This week's efforts represent an experiment for SHARP and the EC. So we haven't made any firm decisions about exactly what will happen in June of 2021, whether there will be some sort of digital version of a SHARP conference or whether we will have reached a stage where it's possible for different countries or regions to have local conferences of some sort. Um, there's discussion of a full online conference and possibilities that um, are being organized and Corinna is behind all of that. And so if she wants to say something about it, she's welcome to, but I don't want to force her to commit to something that's still possibly up in the air. So what would you like to add to that, Corinna? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kurt Anoykul. I'm the director of publications uh, for Sharp, and I have just started a position at the University of Münster, where we have the only center for Anglophone book studies in Germany. Um, and I actually wanted to bring Sharp back to Germany. It was in Germany in 2000, so way ahead of my time. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> as a researcher. Um, physically in uh, 2024, but uh, to help Sharp out of a difficult situation, um, I have offered to run a virtual annual conference out of Munster next summer. Um, and we'll see how that goes along, maybe with local initiatives and other things. But so we're kind of in the planning stages. Um, but watch, watch the spaces and we will tell you more as things firm up. Thank you. And I, my eye has been caught by the chat, by the confusion about people wondering what's happening when. Amsterdam will be 2022, 2021 will be online through Munster or some other arrangements still to be absolutely determined. Obviously this week has given us a chance to see some of the strengths and weaknesses of working online. And we will continue to plan and see what we can come up with. So that's where things stand for that. Um, and then the last item on the agenda, well, not the last item, the, the next last item, members announcements. This is a session that at conferences often makes sense because people have brought along leaflets and things that have been out on the tables. We, we don't have that structure this year, but we have plenty of ways of telling people about things. Um, 
I don't know if Schaff is here. You will have seen an announcement for the conference in November on bookcases. Vincent can say more about that perhaps if he's not here. Um, and any other things people would like to announce, feel free. You know, I would like to say one thing. I want to thank everybody who took the time to respond to the, the publications questionnaire. Uh, Corinna and the editors of Book History, we, it was really, really interesting, really useful. We got a, a huge amount of information out of that. We're still processing it and, and figuring out what actions we're gonna take on it, but I really do wanna thank everybody who took the time to, to answer that questionnaire. So thanks everybody. Now, that was a very impressive response rate for that survey and did give us a really large amount of useful information, as well as encouraging the shift that's already taken place to more green paper that's being used for the journal and ink. I think Corinna can tell us more details, but um, we're, we're improving sustainability and our impact on the environment in ways large and small. Um, I think we should get a lot of carbon credits for not meeting in Amsterdam this year, but <laughs> it doesn't quite work that way. But um, <clears throat> anyway, the, it's a good step and it was something that members were clearly interested in as well. And so we're glad about that. Any other announcements? Um, yeah, I don't like you... yeah, okay. Um, it's just a, a sort of a private announcement and I, which I already announced on the uh, in the chat, but uh, because there's so many uh, bright colleagues here, um, there is an opening for a, a, a doctoral fellowship in, in Le Mans, in my university, uh, within the European program about uh, reading, which I'm running. So the program is called Read IT, Reading Europe Advanced uh, Data Investigation Tool. And um, the doctoral dissertation would be about the emotions of reading. And um, it really needs someone with uh, some kind of cultural history background, literary background, DH abilities too, although that can be arranged if someone does not have the tools at home. But um, it would be probably a sort of a comparative study of a big corpus um, from um, Scottish readers, readers remember and, and um, memories of fiction. It's a program of uh, oral history that was run by Shelley Trower uh, a few uh, years ago. And we've been already working on that with, uh, uh, with Shelley. And we just found in France a huge trove of unexplored archives. It's about 35,000 letters of applicants to uh, a literary but popular uh, um, literary uh, book prize and that were recently deposited at the National Archives. So the idea is to explore both these corpuses with DH methods in order to extract and classify and possibly analyze what the emotions of 20th century English and French readers are. So if you have any interested uh, um, uh, bright and dynamic um, uh, graduate student that would want to engage into this um, uh, fellowship and, and, and doctoral dissertation. It's a three years uh, contract, uh, money is involved obviously. And uh, I would be happy if you could circulate that announcement. I will, I will put it on the sharp list, but I think it's better if um, I can just describe it as I did. So thank you for circulating the announcement. Fantastic opportunity. It sounds like a really amazing collection of letters. Yeah, it is. Any other news? Okay, well, the final item is any other business. Um, I don't know of any, but if anyone has any they'd like to raise, now's your chance. It's a bit like the wedding, last chance to object to a wedding. Um, 
if everybody wants to come have fun with us at uh, Shark Friday tomorrow and also every week, um, we might need to change the time because Europeans are no longer spending their Friday evenings with us because they can now go out in bars. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that eventually. But please do come tomorrow. So Eastern 2 to 3. Uh, UK 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, Central Europe 8 to 9 p.m. And if there's too many of us, we've thought of breakout rooms. Don't worry, you'll come and like get to discuss and not just look at like people in front of their videos. Lisa, do you want to say anything about tomorrow morning's coffee house or well known enough? Yeah, sure. Although I can't remember all the times besides my own time. <laughs> I'm lost somewhere in Zoom, but um, we do have uh, one last coffee house tomorrow. You know, these coffee houses were designed to replicate the experience of running into an officer and saying, you know, I have this issue that I want to talk. I have this idea. So, um, Tomorrow's is focusing on membership issues. I'm the membership secretary, and I'd like to get your ideas about uh, things as uh, diverse as um, dues, um, helping early career researchers and the unwaged, um, ways to encourage more diverse memberships, um, mentoring. I think it will piggyback nicely actually on a lot of things we've been discussing. Um, and I think these issues are all the more important in um, the years when we can't get together at an annual meeting. So I, I hope you'll all come with ideas to chat about some of those. Thanks. Great. Those of you who looked at the annual report will notice that Lisa has by far the longest title of anyone because she's also the director of of Sharks liaisons with all the other academic societies, which Sharks breadth necessarily connects it to. Um, and so she looks after knowing what's going on and how Sharks contributing or participating in all of those other conferences as well. The other area I wanted to add a great thanks to is to Will Slaughter for representing Sharp at ACLS, the American Council of Learned Societies, which has made possible the, the new grants that we've made this year by, as part of their response to COVID, giving all of their members a big discount on membership. We, we also reclassified ourselves from a larger society to a smaller and saved money that way. So we've saved enough money to cover the grants that we're giving this year. We haven't figured out long-term how to manage those, but the, the opportunity that we have, for those of you who weren't there earlier today, Sharp has agreed to create five $500 grants to help researchers of black indigenous people of color membership groups to do research. So that might be ordering images to whatever they can use that would be useful to make their scholarship move forward. Um, so we're still working on the process for awarding those grants, but the membership in ACLS has been a huge benefit to us, well worth the, the normal fees that we've been paying. Um, because we get to find out how every other society in at least North America, but they, they're large ones, are coping with and responding to not only the pandemic, but also to social issues and membership changes, demographics, all sorts of things. And Will has done a superb job of engaging with them and bringing back to Sharp the information that helps us work as an organization. So that's another link that's really important for us and that we're, we're benefiting greatly from. So, <clears throat> um, and this year we're benefiting in lots of ways by them reducing our membership as well. We felt that because they were reducing the membership, I mean, their, their dues in recognition of the costs of um, the effects of the pandemic on societies that we should try to do something positive with it as well. And there was also some feeling for those of you who are the decolonizing book history panel, that it was better to take an action rather than issue a letter expressing whatever we could. And I, I find it quite difficult as president of SHARP to issue letters representing membership's views on anything because 
we're very diverse and we're all over the world. And so this was a much more positive step we felt that would be also absolutely supporting Sharp's mission, which is to develop the field of book history in any way we can. Um, so we're really pleased about that. <clears throat> For those of you watching, you can see that there's some little blue lines on the side of the screen. That's the sun coming up slowly behind the roller blind behind me. Um, but we're almost to the shortest day and I'll be glad when we pass it. One of the great things about being able to go to the Northern Hemisphere for conferences is departing New Zealand winter. It's not bitterly cold here, but it's awfully dark. So, um, but anyway, we will finish before it gets bright behind me and I'll, I'll stop there. And if anybody else has any comments or would like to hang around and chat about anything, I will remain on and leave the meeting open. But otherwise, thanks hugely to all of you for attending. Thank you again to the judges who made the prizes, awarding of the prizes possible. And thank you to all of the authors who contributed to the prizes by submitting things. And congratulations again to the winners. That was fantastic. So, okay. Well, go forth and enjoy whatever is left of the day for you. And I hope to see a lot of you tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon or evening for you um, at the membership event as well. And thanks again to everyone for making Sharp so great.